more than Dale has. <laughs> but we're those kinds of friends. <laughs> yeah. And so too. I just, I'm so excited about what God's going to do today and in this message. And we're so grateful that Tom, really, what an answer to prayer that he's already home and resting. Yeah. And um, Tom uh, is passing a kidney stone. I don't know if he wanted you to know that, but now you can pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> and those things, as you men know, is like having a baby. So <laughs> they're painful. <laughs> but praise God, he's home resting comfortably. And you, I'll do the, okay. I'll do the thank, thank you so much. Um, good morning. Um, I want to thank Kara so much and the worship team this morning. When they sang Holy and Anointed One, I'm just up here sobbing my eyes out because that's one of my life songs. So for however old that song is, 20, 30 years, if I've been scared, I'm singing that song. If I'm happy, I'm singing that song. If I'm worshiping, I'm singing that song. If I'm battling because I'm in a tough place, I'm singing that song. So um, such a blessing. Thank you so much. So um, my name is Sharon Brisbane, and I do lead the prayer team here. Um, if you are on the prayer ministry team right now, would you raise your hand? Awesome. You guys, thank you so much for serving. What does that look like? We're kind of loose with the prayer ministry team because that's kind of my style as well. But at the end of service, you guys have seen, we always offer prayer. And we're getting better at coming forward and making sure that there's somebody here to pray for you. But we have a prayer ministry team besides Tom always being willing to pray for people. Um, and you guys saw the people that come forward for us um, with me. Um, we come forward every week, and we kind of, um, you can go to any of those people at any time, but I wanted to make it a really low commitment, not because these people are not committed, but just so that way no one burns out. So everybody has a week. So we have about five or six people that come front, front every week. And again, thank you guys so much for serving. But how this came about today, it was supposed to be me team teaching with Tom. So that's why Dale was holding my hand up here because of Tom not feeling well today. I got it. And I'm, I'm so honored to share before you guys, but a little bit nervous too. Um, when I think of the prayer um, ministry team and everybody coming forward and where this really was birthed, as we were having a prayer team meeting in the fall, um, do I need to turn the mic off? I hear a little echo. Am I doing stuff good? Um, when, where this all was birthed was when we were praying about the prayer ministry team training in the fall, um, I felt like God said, it's not just supposed to be 20-ish people, 25 people, it's supposed to be the whole church. And so I thought, ooh, how do I say that to Tom? And I was really nervous, and eventually I got my nerve up, and I'm like, Tom, I think the whole church is supposed to know how to pray. We have mighty warriors in this church. We have testimonies that will blow your hair back of God's faithfulness of so many people here. So it's awesome that people are willing to serve every week and we're gonna keep doing that. But at the same time, you guys are all commissioned to pray for each other. And, and um, in my plan today is to talk about that a little bit and then to hopefully finish pretty quick so that we can actually do the practical and pray for each other today. Is that good? Let's jump in. Um, so I wanted to, to um, start with telling you guys a little funny story. So I'm a vineyard girl. I'm a vineyard girl at heart. I've been in and out of vineyard churches based on where we've lived, but I really love the vineyard movement. Um, it was um, uh, about 1991, um, maybe 89. Oh, it was 89. And my friend moved to um, Southern California, and he... Um, a woman in a home Bible study had a prophetic word for him. And it was everything about his life in Ohio. And I went, whoa. Like, I've seen that in the Bible. I knew that stuff was true, but I had not seen it practiced in a kind, laid-back way that was more my style until that happened to him. And he told me, I'm going to this church called The Vineyard in Anaheim. And so I started looking into the vineyard movement. We lived in Columbus at the time. There was a vineyard church there. And that's been my, um, God radically changed the way I approach him from that day to this. And what the vineyard movement did for me, and now it's been a movement for a number of years and it's all, we're all kind of used to it. But what the vineyard movement did for me was, um, 
Before I was a part of the vineyard, I was crazy in love with Jesus, studying scripture, but I tried to carry everybody on my back because I was like, I'm going to carry you into heaven with me like I had the right way to go to heaven, which I don't. But what changed for me in the vineyard is I realized, or I, I had these um, love encounters with God in worship every week, week after week after week, and he radically changed my life, and now I'm in love with the God, with Jesus. Now I'm in love with my friend instead of feeling like I was serving him. And so that's the vineyard movement for me. The vineyard movement's a lot of things. That's what it is for me, and that's why I'm a vineyard girl. So this story. We moved to the Akron area. My husband's from Stowe. His dad's from Stowe. So of course, we have to move up to Stowe eventually. And we moved to Stowe. We were going to a church that was, there was no vineyard in this area. And now we're a vineyard here, but there was no vineyard in the area. And we had visited a lot of churches. Um, those of you that have little kids, we had a son who was uh, about two years old and Logan was a newborn, he was six months old. So dragging these babies to church after church after church was becoming daunting and I was over it. And I'm a Columbus girl, so if you guys know Columbus, I was used to a lot of traffic, it's go, 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 go when I moved up here, so I, and I'm kind of a uh, don't mince words. So I was calling churches saying this, and by fluke, the secretary of the church that day happened to be out for lunch, and Tom Bloom, our pastor that we love, answered the phone, which he normally did not do, and I said my little spiel. Hi, my name is Sharon. We're looking for a new church in the area. We just moved here about six months ago. And I'm just wondering, have you guys ever heard of the Vineyard Movement? Because if you haven't, you're probably not what we're looking for. <laughs> and Tom still loves us. <laughs> and he said, he goes, I know the Vineyard Movement. We're not a vineyard, but I think you'll like us. And we did. And we've um, just loved, loved Tom. Um, just as a, a leader and as a friend for a number of years now. That was uh, quite a long time ago. Um, so why do we do healing prayer? And this is my PowerPoint, if it's going to work. We'll see. Maybe. There we go. And to the first slide. Let's see if I'm the... Do I have the power? Oh, it's on. Oh, it's There we go. So I wanted to talk, why do we do a healing prayer? And I have a picture of John Wimber up, and I'll talk about John in just a minute. We do a healing prayer because Jesus told us to. So we see in Luke and Matthew and Luke 23 that the kingdom of God, we're to proclaim, in, we're to make the proclamation of the kingdom of God and to demonstrate the kingdom of God. And that's one thing that John Wimber was known for. Um, I'll go back to John, and we're going to stay on John for a little bit. Um, the Great Commission, Jesus came and he spoke to them and he said, all, um, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, you guys, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. Matthew 28, 1 through 20. Jesus summoned his 12 and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Matthew 10, 1. And then one more. Jesus promised that we would do greater works than he did. John 14, 12. Wow. That kind of blows my mind that because of what Jesus did, and, and Mark shared in communion, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but he also gave us the authority that he had to pray for the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about John Wimber and kind of the vineyard movement. So um, if you guys know of the Vineyard Movement, John Wimber, if you Google it, says John Wimber was the founder of the Vineyard Movement. He was one of the founding fathers of the Vineyard Movement. But why we point to John so much was, well, let me tell you a little bit more about John first, see if I have time. I do. 
Um, John Wimber was an accomplished musician. He was one of the Righteous Brothers, so I think they called him Johnny Wimber when he was one of the Righteous Brothers. He was an accomplished musician on 15 instruments. Little side note, you guys know my husband is an amazing guitar player. His guitar teacher lives in Columbus, Ohio, and he's an, an amazing guitar teacher, has a master's degree in guitar. And when John would come in to Columbus, he'd do his little spiely speaking, whatever he needed to do. His hangout time was with Scott's guitar teacher, Jerry, and they would just jam. So I love that John Wimber is one of the founder of the vineyard movements for, for around the world, and yet he was still a musician at heart, a guy who liked to jam. And by the way, Jerry never introduced us to John, just so you know. <laughs> um, so many churches that we hear of, and you may not have heard of these churches, and that's okay, but many churches that, that are, are practicing praying for the sick, pray, praying for people to be healed today, and they're seeing lots of healings, would point back to John Wimber. So they, places like Bethel, the Toronto Catch the Fire. The Toronto Catch the Fire was originally called the Toronto Vineyard. So they all could point their finger back to John Wimber. John back in the, and I, you know, I didn't write the timing down on this, but I think it was the 70s, 80s, John was doing conferences called Signs and Wonders. And he just called them Signs and Wonders conferences. And like Dale said, I, I attended um, Bethel School of Ministry. And one of the things that Bill Johnson says often is, they went to a John Wimber conference and they saw healings like they had never seen anywhere else and they brought it back to their church, like they caught it from John and brought it back to their church and it's really God everywhere, right? It's not John, it's not Bethel, it's not, it's not one particular person, but they caught that faith from John at a Signs and Wonders conference and brought it back to their church. They got discouraged because they didn't see tons of healings all the time, and they kind of walked away from that. And then about 10 or 20 years later, they heard it again, they saw it again in another place, and they said, God, if you will continue to move on our church, we will never change the story. And now that's why we know of Bethel today. But it started with John Wimber at a Signs and Wonders conference. Um, John's big thing was he would go up and do prayer. You know, he'd pray for people like the evangelists we would hear. Um, um, I did not prepare this part, sorry, but like Oral Roberts and things like that, you know, um, Catherine Kuhlman. They absolutely saw healings. There are documented healings of what God did in these people's meetings. And John could do the same thing. And he came off stage one time and his wife said, please don't keep doing that. I'm misquoting. But she said something to the effect of, John, please don't keep doing that because then people think that they can't. So John, would you teach other people to do what you do? Would you encourage other people to do what you do? And so John would regularly be say then, everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to pray for the sick. And again, that's why Tom wanted us to talk about prayer today. We all get to play. We all get to pray for the sick. It's not just a few people on the prayer ministry team. It's all of us, because none of us are the healers. It's God, and we all have him living inside us, right? I have personally seen many healings, and I'm and, uh, so excited I have the time. I get to tell you about a few of them. So one of the first ones that I saw was a guy named Mike Huddle. He goes to the Columbus Vineyard Church. He was in Scott Mines home group for a number of years. He later um, was married and was a camp counselor, and Logan was, in his, was one of his um, kids in camp counseling. And um, he was about in his late 20s, early 30s when we met him, and this was 89, 90, something like that, so a long time ago. And he was in his 30s. His whole life he had had grand mal seizures once or twice a week. He was on 30 medications a day, and it makes me cry because I got to watch as God healed him, and then I got to watch as God put the pieces of his life back together. So again, grand mal seizures his entire life. John Wimber prayed for him, no more grand mal seizures. It took the doctors a number of years to get him off of those 30 meds. And I'm here to tell you today, Logan would not have even known he had grand mal seizures when he was his camp counselor. Isn't God good? 
In that same home group, I was, now you'll laugh at this, I was, I'm a hairdresser, so I was on my feet all day. I was working full-time as a hairdresser at the time, and I was teaching aerobics. Yes, this body taught aerobics at one time. <laughs> and so my legs were really hurting me, especially my shins. I had really bad shin splints. And I had gone to the home group where Mike was one of the attendees. He wasn't the one who prayed for me. And they had a prophetic word in that home group, and they said, somebody has some issues with, it may have been legs, shin splints again. It's been so many years ago. Well, I kept my mouth shut. I can promise you, in that home group of 30 people, nobody had their leg in an ace bandage but me, right? But they said, pray for somebody's leg, and I kept my mouth shut? I didn't know. So we get in a smaller group. There's about three women, uh, myself and two or three other women, and they're praying for me, and God healed my shin splints. I had no more pain from that day on. Yeah. So cool. So I got to see it for Mike, and then I got to experience it for myself, and I've never been the same. And I know he can do it. Some other ones that were fun, um, I have three kids. So I have Olivia, Logan is my middle one, and then Garrett is my oldest. Garrett was a wrestler in high school, and something happened with his knee, and it wasn't enough to get surgery or even go to the doctor more than once, but it was enough that it was annoying for him. And I don't know if you guys have ever had this type of pain, but for Garrett, his knee, if he would hit it against one of the pews, he would go into excruciating pain. But he could walk, he could run, he could do everything else. It was just this weird touch tactile thing. And a few years ago, God came in a really powerful way um, here in Akron, and somebody prayed for knees, and they prayed for my son Garrett. And I didn't really know what was going on. It was one of those busy meetings, and I um, walked to the back of the church, and there was a pew across the back of the church, and my son Garrett is sitting back there, and he is 20-year-old type guy, hitting his knee as hard as he can over and over and over again. I'm like, dude, what is going on? God healed his knee. He had had that injury for four years. We had never even thought to keep praying for it. We just thought it was something that he was going to have to live with. And he's never had that pain since. Amen. So cool. Another time I was in a meeting and here in Akron, and, there was, and I've told you guys this before, but I love it, so I'm going to repeat it over and over again. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Tim prophetic word went out, pray for eyes. Everybody's kind of bunched up together like we'll be today, you know, kind of everywhere, nothing super, you know, organized, or I don't even know who prayed for him. Somebody prayed for, for eyes, not knowing that Tim's eye, Tim's left eye was blind since birth. He was in his late 20s, early 30s, and it had been blind since birth. His optic nerve was not connected, is what the doctors had told him. Um, they prayed for eyes, they prayed for Tim, didn't think much of it. Tim went out to smoke a cigarette and thought that there was a piece of dirt in his eye and he was trying to knock it out. He didn't realize that he had regained his sight. And over the next, and I don't even know if he had become a Christian yet or not at that time, which is even cooler. Um, and over the next, I think it was four to six weeks, at first it was kind of a spot, then it got a little foggy, but he could see and now he has full sight. Here in Akron, not in Mozambique, not in Africa, not in the deepest, darkest Amazon, here in Akron, Ohio. Um, Dale and I went to a conference together, and I'm so sorry I didn't ask you if I could share this. Dale and I went to a conference together, and she um, asked for prayer. She had had pain in the left side of her neck and down the left side, different issues down the left, her left side. Someone prayed for her. She's had no issues since July. Oh, God. Not just Akron, Cuyahoga Falls. And then Mimi, we prayed for Mimi's back six months or a year ago, and she's had no back pain since here in our church. Go, God. Um, I think I have, I don't know what my next slide is. Can I have my slide pages so I know what I put on my own PowerPoint this morning? Oh, Yep, do that. That's perfect. Before I do this verse, though, I wanted to say one little quote that I did not put on my PowerPoint. And I just, I'm going to read this quote because I thought it was perfect. 
Um, this is by Rich Nathan, who's the Columbus Vineyard pastor, and Ken Wilson, who is the pastor of the, um, I think he's still the pastor up there. He was when he wrote the book. Um, this is a book called Empowered Evangelicals. They wrote this book together. Little funny side note, I'm a Columbus girl. Rich Nathan was a professor at OSU, and Ken Wilson lives near um, University of Michigan. The enemies wrote a book together, and here's the quote. John Wimber developed a helpful five-step healing model to assist in following God's direction regarding how to pray for a person. This five-step model is not a technique or a secret formula that makes healing happen. We must always remember and keep in mind that God does the healing and that his sovereign will is um, determinative, never have used that word till today, uh, regarding whether someone gets healed. This model simply enables people to look for God's sovereign will when faced with someone who needs healing. I love that. So I'm gonna talk about this formula, the five step pieces of the vineyard prayer model, but again, it's not a formula. It's just kind of a good checklist when we pray for people. It's not positive thinking either. Sometimes when I've been praying for people up here, there'll be nothing, God doesn't do anything, and they'll say, oh, but by faith I believe. No, either God healed or he didn't. We don't need to do spiritual gymnastics, you know? I want him to heal every time, but if he doesn't, we don't need to pretend that he did. We just need to keep asking him to do it. And it's not limited to physical healing. When Dale talks about my testimony, um, my testimony could be like playing a country song backward. You know, country song, you lose your dog, you lose your wife or husband, you lose your job. I did all those, those and got them all back, plus. So um, absolutely emotional, um, spiritual healing God's done radically with me as well. A few practical approaches to prayer. We wanna pray, when, when I'm approaching and when you guys are approaching each other for prayer, not that you would be like this, but sometimes we feel like when somebody says something we're praying for, almost like it's their fault. And I just wanna remind you guys, remind myself, God's not mad at them, he's not mad at us. He's actually madly mad with us. He's madly in love with us, but he's not upset. He's not in a bad mood. And then my verse. I love this verse again when I'm approaching um, God and people. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them, not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Yeah. Yep. A couple of other practical things. We want to pray with a partner, if possible. We know sometimes it gets really busy and you need to pray for somebody by yourself, but if at all possible, pray with a partner. I've been praying a lot recently with John, and it's been amazing the things that he'll pray for that I wasn't even thinking of. So it's awesome, you know, two women, two guys. It's been John and I, or I'm sorry, Greg and I recently. And so it's so awesome the things, you know, when you're with somebody else, they may think to pray for things or get insights that you don't have. And also, if possible, if you have to pray one-on-one, -on -one, try to pray a woman with a woman and a guy with a guy. I've told you my story at times has been like a country music song. So we don't know where people are at. We don't know what kind of traumas they've experienced. We don't know what kind of abuses. That just protects us as the prayer person and it protects them when we're praying for them. So if it needs to be one-on-one, -on -one, try to have it be woman with woman, guy with guy. And now let's jump into the steps. So what's the first step? See how I'm doing on time. Do the interview. We wanna find out why we're praying for them, where does it hurt? We wanna listen to them on two levels. We wanna listen for the natural, what's naturally going on with you, but also asking God at the same time, God, what's going on here? They came up for their throat, but God might wanna do something even more, or something different. And keep it really brief too. It should just be like 10% of the time that you're spending with them. We're not there to counsel. We just want to ask them, what do, you want to, what do you want me to pray for? And let's do that prayer. Um, again, just to allow God to have more of a say of what's happening. 
Then the diagnosis, you know, they've told us what's going on. I'm kind of listening to see what God's saying. And the question is, Lord, what are you doing? I ask that all the time when I'm here at church. God, what are you doing? We have awesome prophetic words like Dan gave, you know, God, what are you doing? But then for one-on-one, -on -one, God, what are you doing for this person right now as we're praying for them? Um, and then just wait. If it feels uncomfortable, say, do you mind if we wait just a minute on the Lord? You know, see what God's doing. Give him a minute to talk to you, whatever that looks like. Um, sometimes I need to shut my eyes. I'm a very... Um, have a lot of energy, and I'm very visual, so for me to concentrate on the Lord, I do shut my eyes to concentrate for a minute, and I just tell the person I'm praying for that's what I'm doing. Some people are completely unchurched, so the things that we think are normal church things, like standing in front of them and shutting your eyes, that, that's a very church culture thing. It may make somebody new to the church or new to the church world uncomfortable. So just let them know what you're doing. We're gonna wait for a minute. I'm gonna shut my eyes and just pray for a minute. And then if you feel like something is going on and you need help, grab somebody. Don't be afraid to say, hey, would you wait just a minute and go find somebody to get some help. Next one. Oh, perfect. I think they're clicking it for me in the back because I, I didn't do good. <laughs> Need help. Um, prayer selection. Now we're going to, you know, what type of prayer are we going to pray, be praying? And this sounds so methodical, right? But for me, who's been praying for people for years, I forget to step back and go, God, what type of prayer am I supposed to be doing for this person? You know, because I get into all excited, oh, Holy Spirit's moving and what's going on, and I forget, like, they asked for healing prayer. Let's make sure we pray for healing for them. Are we doing intercession, you know, um, asking God to touch somebody, or are they doing it themselves, supplication? Do they have some sin that they need to confess, and we're just kind of standing there with them as they confess it? Or are we commanding something, you know, make shoulder move right, leg Straighten out, you know, what is it? Or commanding a demon, hey, out of here. You are not welcome anymore. Or is it a blessing? Um, just blessing the person, blessing what's going on with them. Um, or again, a rebuke. Do you sense something going on spiritually that we need to just shut down? Um, you guys have heard or possibly seen sometimes when people think that dem the demonic needs to be really crazy and loud and screaming and foaming at the mouth. We have the authority of Jesus, and we can just say no, stop, no, no, you, get, you have to be silent. It can be very calm, which is also very respectful to the person that we're praying for, very honoring of them as well. And then step four. Let's jump right into the ministry time in step four, right? What are we actually going to pray for? Laying on of hands. We see so many examples of, you know, laying on of hands in the Bible. But ask people first. I have friends that don't like touch. Somebody has touched them in their life, and it was not a good thing. So make sure that you ask people if, if you can touch them. And if they say no, be respectful of that. Because honestly, God's doing the healing. He doesn't need us to touch people. But I love our church, and we are a huggy, touchy church, and it's so lovely, and I don't want that to end. But just be respectful and ask before. Invite the Holy Spirit to come. Super easy. Holy Spirit, would you come while you're praying for someone? We want his manifest presence to come, right? And then look, ask, and listen. Look. I told you I kind of am a visual person, so I shut my eyes a lot when I'm trying to concentrate. But when I'm praying for someone, I open my eyes. And we had a really cool thing happen up here. Susan Capps, which as you know is struggling right now, can't be with us. She was praying for someone with me one Sunday morning. And we had prayed a couple prayers, but the person we were praying for was not done. And I was like, okay, I feel like I'm done. She's not We'll pray for another couple minutes. We started praying for her, and she left the building. Like, if you guys have ever prayed for people, and you can see that their eyes are, like, her eyes.